is an assistant professor in the PMNR department. She did her fellowship after uh, completing her PMNR residency here at Sinai at, um, at Northwell in brain injury medicine. So she her interests very closely align with uh, what, what we're looking to partner with in our department. Um, she has an interest in the application of rehabilitation during acute care and critical care, um, and that's what she'll be talking to us about today. So welcome, Sophia. We're very happy to have you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Can you guys hear me? We can. We're good? Okay. I'll share my screen. Okay, so thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm the new PM&R consultant attending at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, I'm not gonna go into my background because we already did that, but I'm gonna be talking about the uh, PM&R neurosurgical consults and the role of physiatry and acute care. So for my outline today, I'm gonna be doing a quick introduction, some definitions, the purpose of the consulting service, when to request a consult, the goals of a consulting service, and the role of physiatry and acute care, specifically in the brain and spinal cord injury population, disposition, acute inpatient rehabilitation discharge, patient profiles that I'm looking for when I'm you know, seeing a neurosurgical consult, and then basically how to place a consult, and I'll leave questions till the end. Okay, so first off, why a PM&R consult in the hospital? I've been talking to, I'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit because I've been talking to a lot of different services. I've been meeting with transplant. I've been meeting with some of the therapists too. I've been meeting with oncology. And the major question that I get is, you know, I've already um, uh, consulted PT and OT, like why get rehab on board? You know, what do you have to offer as like a consult? And I think that this is an interesting question. It's also like a very valid question. Um, but I've also been talking to a lot of the therapists and the therapists have been saying, you know, I have a lot of services that say optimize the patient before they leave. They go optimize, optimize. And, you know, some of the therapists are like, what does that mean? Does that mean, you know, exercise with the patients more? Does that mean, you know, you know, work with them more frequently? And then, you know, a light bulb went off in my head and I was like, that's exactly what, you know, a rehab doctor does is they're here to optimize the patient. Um, so if you're asking yourself any of these questions when you have, you know, some of your patients, like why isn't my patient progressing in their therapies as expected, given their specific diagnosis, why is my patient's mobility score very low, why is their patient's impact score really low, and then why has my patient participation and function declined since they've been in the hospital, then you should be considering a rehab consult for these, for these patients. Um, and a lot of the reasons why these patients aren't progressing in the hospitals, it's, it's because of exactly what I specialize in. So my specialty areas are spasticity management, weakness and debility, neuropathic and nociceptive pain, uh, disorders of consciousness. Um, uh, obviously, I, I have a background in uh, traumatic brain injury and brain injury in general, and some neurocritical care experience. So I really like the DOC patients. Delirium, agitation, memory impairment, aphasia, language deficits, mood disorders, and then I put other disposition just because, you know, obviously as a rehab doctor, we talk a lot about where patients go after the hospital. And then I also thought about, you know, why PMR consults in the hospital. Another major question I've been getting is, you know, why consult PMNR so early? Why do we need you in the ICU? Why do we need you, you know, in the hospital in general? Usually we see a PMNR person who's in and just inpatient rehab. And I like to say it's just because, you know, we constantly talk about prognostication with a patient, especially like, you know, I mean, all patients, but a lot of the neurosurgical patients. And we say, hey, you know, do we have better outcomes if we, you know, have some type of biomarker for a brain injury patient or, you know, time to crane, like craning or like surgical uh, interventions, you know, um, do we have better outcomes? And I think one of the major ways of seeing if a person's going to have a good outcome is just what their recovery trajectory in the hospital is. So if I can see that early on and I'm in the ICU, I see how they're doing, I see how sick these patients are, and I'm able to kind of optimize them while they're in the hospital, I'll have a way better idea of uh, where they should go and the appropriate place that they should be later on. Um, so I'm looking at both medical and functional barriers. So a lot of the primary care or primary physicians on the services are looking at these medical barriers in terms of, you know, if the patient has sepsis, if the patient is, uh, you know, has uh, other types of medical issues, but then I'm also looking at functional barriers. So, 
does the patient have bad hemiparesis? Are they aphasic? Do they have coordination issues? And taking these two together and thinking, you know, how is this person going to function in their uh, everyday life after they get out of the hospital? So that's that's kind of what I do. I look at, I try to optimize a patient. I look at the recovery trajectory, and then I can prognosticate in terms of how this patient's going to do, you know, years years down the road. So we can start these conversations very early with families and with um, with the patients themselves to let them know, you know. Uh, kind of create expectations for them in terms of uh, uh, where they're going to be at in a few years. So for those of you guys who don't know what physical medicine and rehab is, is PMNR is a medical specialty that emphasizes prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation of people disabled by disease or disorder or uh, or disease, disorder, or injury. And I like to define it as a physiatrist helps diagnose and treat secondary complications that arise from illness and injury using a multi-system and multidisciplinary approach. There are a lot of subdivisions of PM&R, okay? So basically, I'm not gonna read these all off to you, but um, my, my focus, and you know, I'm gonna be taking all different types of rehab consults. I have some oncology patients right now. I have a lot of neuro patients, but I obviously my background is mostly in neuro rehab. So looking at the spinal cord brain injury patients, I have concussion experience too. Um, and other neurologicals is, uh, is where I have the majority of my experience. So the purpose of a PM&R consulting service is, here, let me just move this for a second, actually. The purpose of the PMR consulting service is dedicated to enhancing patient outcomes by focusing on functional impairments and initiating early rehabilitation interventions in the acute hospital setting. Basically, our objective is to monitor patients throughout their hospitalization, address their rehabilitation needs to ensure safe and optimal discharge. Uh, classically, we did have a um, attending who would see these consults in the hospital um, at Mount Sinai, except they were basically consulted on disposition issues. So if a patient needed to go to acute inpatient rehab, they'd you know, see the patient and help kind of with the disposition process. Right now I have probably about like, you know, 16 patients on my consulting list and I'll actually follow them through their hospital stay, depending on what their rehab needs are going to be. Um, but, you know, some will stay on a list where it's like I can follow every other day and then some will stay on the list that I kind of see actively every day if we're doing specific medication management. And then when to request a PM&R consult. So for neurological injuries, the critically ill, prolonged ICU and hospital stays, surgical optimization, post-operative care, musculoskeletal conditions, and complex medical patients, which is, you know, a lot of the neurosurgical patients fall under many of these uh, different categories. The goals, so preventions uh, of secondary complications of illness and injury. We want to maximize recovery potential, facilitate safe disposition planning, interdisciplinary care coordination, improve quality of life and education. <clears throat> and I think it's really important we can start this education very early for these patients who I'm consulted on and have ongoing conversations with the families in order to make them feel comfortable and to understand what life is going to look like in years to come. So the, the role of physiatry in acute care, we, we usually don't have a physiatrist in the acute hospital setting, but um, this is how I see the trajectory going from the um, intensive care unit floor rehabilitation. Um, it doesn't matter what type of rehab these patients are going to. I like to see patients that are going to a subacute rehab who are going into acute inpatient rehabilitation or home. I've seen some patients so far where, you know, they went in for like, uh, decompression and they are doing actually relatively fine, but I just go and check on them. And I say, Hey, do you need any like rehab needs as an outpatient? Because we are also growing our outpatient services at, uh, for our, you know, our rehab. So, um, I can connect them to good pain management or, you know, to other MSK PM&R, uh, rehab doctors, um, in the Mount Sinai system. So I think that that's really important. Um, those are very, very quick consults also. Um, and then I also like to see patients who are just going to a subacute rehab because we can really optimize them while they're in the hospital before they go to a subacute. Because as you guys know, going to a subacute rehab sometimes is, you know, is not great for these patients and, you know, they won't get certain interventions. So I've done Botox for some patients prior to leaving or, you know, some peripheral joint injections to help with some pain um, prior to actually going to subacute. So not only uh, acute inpatient rehab. And the whole goal is for the patient to eventually go home. So for the role of physiatry and acute care, some of these specialty areas that I would be focusing on as a con uh, consultant would be doing early neurological exams. So the um, 
Coma Recovery Scale Revised. I've been doing that for some of my DOC patients that I have been consulted on now who basically are on a vent, traped, um, and have DOC, and we're trying to wake them up. Um, I'll work on wakefulness, delirium, aphasia we can work on, depression, anxiety, you know, seizures, um, and then optimize sleep-wake cycles. And then I have experience with headache management too, uh, mostly with traumatic brain injury headache management, but you know, that's something that I can definitely comment on. And then pain management in general, as a physiatrist, we're really good with uh, neuropathic pain management, and then also some uh, you know, peripheral joint injections. So I have experience doing knee injections and shoulder, so if somebody has, you know, hemiparesis with um, shoulder subluxation or rotator cuff injury, we can, you know, work with that while we're in the hospital. So other MSK issues, I kind of went over that. We'll, I'll definitely work with PT and OT, early mobilization with these patients, work on splinting and casting. Um, a lot of, I, you know, this doesn't really have to do with neurosurgical consults, but this is just an example. I have a patient who is a um, amputee on actually all four limbs. So working with the patient in terms of functional adaptations to the weight bearing restrictions while in the hospital is very important. Um, spasticity management. I've now been consulted on several patients who um, needed Botox in the hospital. You know, I obviously will see if that's, you know, appropriate at that time, if we should just start medications, but it's something that we definitely think about if spasticity is kind of, um, you know, happening early on in the course, especially if the patients, you know, that kind of develops if they're, you know, basically traked and on a vent in here for, you know, four to six weeks. So then working on prevention as well. For cardiology, um, I look at, you know, if the patient's getting out of bed to chair daily, um, looking at their PTOT evaluations and making sure they're on a graded exercise program and looking at orthostatic hypertension issues, pulmonary. I also have, um, I wrote a paper not too long ago with, um, that looks at long-term mechanically ventilated patients in the LTAC setting. And um, because I have a LTAC experience uh, in California and um, we've looked over in this paper it was specifically with uh, like over 460 um, trached patients who had all types of diagnosis, a lot of them neurological and um, seeing why they couldn't get off of vent. So I have some DOC patients right now who, you know, I've been kind of seeing why is this patient on a vent still? You know, is there something that we can add? Is this a musculoskeletal issues? Are their diaphragms like completely out? And that's why they can't, you know, get de uh, decannulated or sorry, get, um, you know, off, off of the vent. So it's something that I can definitely comment on and, um, you know, work with the respiratory therapist to see if we can actually progress their respiratory status. Then GI, for a lot of our, you know, spinal cord injury patients, like you already know, they have uh, upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, bowel issues, as well as bladder issues. Um, we're very good at um, working with that while in the inpatient uh, rehabilitation unit. And I think that some of these things can be implemented early in order to prevent like secondary complications, because I know a lot of patients end up having bowel obstructions or something because they're not on appropriate bowel regimen. So it's uh, things that I'll be definitely looking at and be able to comment on and make sure are um, happening while in the hospital. So specifically the role of physiatry and acute care for brain injury. Um, these are the, uh, some of the medical and functional barriers I'm looking at. So I can definitely help with paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity. I, you know, been treating that while in uh, the ICU for some of these patients wakefulness issues, pain management, like I talked about, neuropathic versus nociceptive, spasticity management, central fevers, and then respiratory failure, like I talked about before. And the functional barriers that I'm looking at for a brain injury patient are basically hemiparesis and ecclesia, diffuse weakness, spatial awareness, deficits, coordination issues. And I know our physical therapists uh, and OTs, occupational therapists are just really wonderful. So a lot of the uh, patients that I've been seeing thus far, um, you know, they've kind of pointed out to me saying, hey, this, you know, this patient looks like they're not progressing or they have a really bad spatial, you know, neglect or they have hemiparesis with spasticity. Do you think that you can go in there and, and check them out and see if there's anything that you can do to make these patients a little bit better? Um, so, so that would be, that's my role in the brain injury population. So for the intensive care unit, I know the intensivist works, you know, basically ICP management, CPP management, seizures, um, everything that you kind of see in the ICU, but in, uh, you know, if I'm consulted, then I'll be basically kind of co-managing these things, obviously knowing everything that's happening in the ICU and what the intensive intensivists are doing but also co-managing like coma evaluations, making sure I'm uh, paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity isn't happening, respiratory failure, kind of everything that we've talked about. Um, yeah, and then on the floor, we just kind of 
keep this continuum going on. So making sure I'm working with the therapist, making sure pain is under control. I also have um, experience with decannulating patients while um, in the hospital setting as well. So if they're ready to kind of get off of, you know, not have their trach anymore, it's something that I can work with the pulmonologist with and in terms of progressing their care, you know, and then optimizing sleep weight patterns because a lot of people just don't progress in their therapies because they have delirium and, you know, they can't, you know, they are basically sleeping during the day. So making sure that we're fo focusing on the well-being of the patient and, and seeing what's really um, inhibiting them to progress. For a spinal cord injury patient, I mean, there's so many more functional barriers in this, but um, most of the things that we're looking on, looking at, you know, medical barriers, functional barriers. So a lot of our spinal cord injury patients have orthostatic hypotension, neuropathic pain, autonomic dysreflexia. These are uh, also medical barriers that I can talk about with the families early on, especially autonomic dysreflexia, since it's a issue for patients, um, you know, with higher um, levels of injury, but they don't, a lot of them don't really know about it and families don't. Um, and then functional barriers, no spasticity management, and then also all of the adaptive equipment that we can use to uh, help them, you know, function while they're in the hospital. In the intensive care unit, obviously the intensivist is looking at spinal shock and respiratory failure for these patients. Um, there's a high rate of pulmonary embolism very early on in pneumonia for um, for the spinal cord injury patients. So in the ICU, it's good for me to be seeing those types of things. We can start the INSKI exams pretty early because we know that it's effective when, you know, 72 hours, about 72 hours post injury. So doing those exams early to see kind of prognosticating where these patients will be at. Um, work on agitation, delirium, and like I uh, talked about earlier, bowel and bladder management. And then I think, especially with the brain injury and spinal cord injury patients, it's really, it is really good for them to go to acute rehab if they can. And, you know, everybody would benefit from an acute rehab stay. Um, just you are exercising more. They're great therapists there, um, except for, I think with specifically spinal cord injury, brain injury, going to a specialized unit is really good for them. So starting that discharge process early and uh, making sure they get into the appropriate facilities um, that they should be going to. On the floor, we'll be doing the same exact thing, neurogenic bowel, bladder, working on anxiety, depression, because, you know, as things um, kind of come up and coping, they start to cope with their um, new injury. It's important to address those issues, early mobilization and continue the um, in-ski exams while we're in the hospital. So disposition comes up a lot, obviously, as a rehab doctor. Um, what I'm really looking at is like if the patient has social support. So a lot of the people say, hey, you know, is this patient a good acute uh, acute rehab candidate? But if they don't really have a great support system and aren't able to be discharged home after the acute rehab stay, it's going to be pretty hard to talk to the social workers and <clears throat> have them admit the patient. So I think working on these support systems early on to say how these patients are actually going to be able to get discharged home for a certain amount of those um, that can, that do have that support is um, important. Um, I look at their previous functional status, uh, the functional progress while they're in the hospital, um, ability to tolerate therapies, medical stability, and motivation. Some of the patients just don't want to <clears throat> work out that much. You know, they said three hours of therapy is too much. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm relatively old. I can't do it. And um, so really talking with the families about whether or not that's appropriate for them. I, as a consult, want to see all types of patients. So patients going home, going to acute inpatient rehab, going to a subacute rehab, going to long-term acute care. So I know that some, you know, there aren't many LTACs around, but seeing the patients going to LTACs would be great because I do like vent management and I do like um, the disorders of consciousness patients. And then, you know, obviously they get disp dispo to a nursing home as well sometimes. <clears throat> like I said, um, a lot of our patients won't be going to acute inpatient rehab, but if they are, I'm looking at if they can, um, their ability to tolerate three hours of therapy a day. If they're medically stable, um, we will usually like to switch all of their IV to PO uh, pain medications. Uh, we want final recommendations from consultants. We want updated PT and OT evaluations. It's really nice to uh, know their length of anticoagulation if it's um, applicable for the patient. Um, it's uh, sometimes very unclear with these patients going into acute inpatient rehab how long they should be on anticoagulation, so making that very clear. Uh, Weight-bearing status, if that's applicable, and then uh, decannulating the patient before going to acute inpatient rehab is really great. Um, if that um, is within 
the patient's means and then uh, cranioplasty prior to transfer. The, I know that a lot of services, you know, there's different studies that say, you know, the optimal time for cranioplasty, but I do know there are a subset of patients who've been, you know, in the hospital for a long period of time um, and then are going to a subacute rehab. And the transfer process from a subacute to get a cranioplasty going back to the hospital sometimes is very difficult for these patients. So I've seen some in the ED still without, you know, their skull flaps and stuff. And so I think that being able to talk with your service and saying, hey, is this a, a good time for the patient to get their cranioplasty before they leave would be important. And making sure they have their follow-up appointments and then uh, their social support system in place. So some of the patient profiles of the um, that I'm looking at is, you know, we don't see all the TBI patients, but obviously I have a background in TBI, but post-operative TBI patients who need rehab, I'm looking for spinal cord injury patients, whether or not it's complete or incomplete SCI. I love working with those types of patients. They need bowel and bladder management and pressure injury management. Um, subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage patients that need neurostimulants, uh, spasticity management and support transitioning from critical care to rehab. Uh, for a brain tumor, a spinal tumor patients, I'm looking for uh, those with balance deficits um, requiring physical, occupational, or cognitive rehab. Also patients with primary or metastatic tumors involving central nervous system that require maybe some palliative rehabilitation interventions too, so working with palliative care in order to optimize these patients. Hydrocephalus patients with VP shunts, a lot of them have gait instabilities or cognitive impairments, so I can work with them. And then degenerative spine disorders requiring surgery. So post laminectomy patients, I said, I'd like to even see the patients who are potentially going home to connect them with the right rehab services um, on discharge. Then peripheral nerve surgery. So patients who have undergone decompression or nerve repair. So if they require motor retraining, these um, I like working with these types of patients. Patients with significant neurological deficits post-surgery, so who have aphasia, dysphagia, hemiparesis, working with speech therapy to help with their swallow is also important, something that I have extensive experience in. And then complex cranial and spinal cord um, surgery, so patients un undergoing resection um, who also have balance and, uh, balance and coordination issues. So... Now, towards the end of my talk, how do you actually place the PM&R consult? Um, I'm on Amion. My name is Dr. Sophia Barchuk. Um, you can Epic chat me. I have a consult phone. It's listed right there. And then you can also place an IP consult to rehab MD order, and I'll see the patient promptly. Okay. Thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. Sorry if I spoke too fast. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Does anyone have any uh, questions or, or comments? Hi, Sophia. This is Chris Kellner. Uh, thank you so Hi. much. Yeah. Um, I was very interested in some of the disorders of consciousness uh, rehabilitation you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's always been a little bit of a mystery when to call a consult from the MNR for a patient who's uh, minimally conscious over their recovery. And generally, Patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage and intracerebral hemorrhage will go from the ICU to the neurosurgery service. So we do end up primarily managing them. Um, you know, what what kind of patients are you looking to uh, help out with there? And uh, what kind yeah. of options do they have? Yeah, uh, that's... The, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt go, you. Go, go for it. Yeah. No, that's such an interesting question because I actually met with Neha like yesterday about starting like a, a formal protocol for the DSC patients in the hospital because, right. yeah, we've we've both noticed and, and, you know, I've just been doing the consulting service now for like a month and a half, but I've really noticed that, you know, a lot of the patients who, like you said, had a big subarachnoid hemorrhage and they are status post crany, they're kind of traked and then, you know, on a vent and sort of sitting in the hospital. And we're sort of just waiting for them to go to a subacute rehab. And, you know, and that's really it. Um, what I like to say is, you know, I like to see those patients right away. So I, I actually think like, if you think this is going to be, you know, a patient who's in that position in the ICU, like I don't mind seeing them. Um, obviously depending on if they're having a lot of seizures, like I wouldn't be able to start like neurostimulants that early. Um, but obviously knowing that they're having seizures or something, I can still at least monitor that until it's like appropriate to start like neurostimulation. I think a lot of the patients also have really bad spasticity. I have one patient who's just like super contracted and I've talked to her family and, you know, they're really concerned about it. So trying to get OT over there and like at least working on the spasticity management so she doesn't have that much like skin breakdown. 
And then, uh, you know, just really seeing, because a lot of the patients I think are there for a longer period of time, you know, depending on what their disposition looks like. So it could be, you know, about a month to six weeks or something. So, you know, keep monitoring to see if they're going to wake up. A, a lot of the times I'll also start like an antidepressant or something that's not going to or, you know, something for aphasia. So it's not going to affect, you know, um, you know, seizure threshold that much. So there's things that I can tinker with. And I really love that patient population. I was just talking to Neha and I was like, I think that we're going to start to make an actual protocol for these types of uh, types of patients. That's really helpful. Thank you. Look forward yeah, to working yeah. with you with those Thank patients. You. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, I just want to echo. You're really glad that you are here. We all know increasingly that recovery begins with the moment of admission and um, the early phases of recovery are always a steeper slope than the later ones mm -hmm. so getting your input and starting this process to begin at the beginning is going to really change the long-term outcome we many of us believe Oh, Thank great. You. I'm I'm very excited. I'm very excited to be working with you guys. And you have a, a lot of patients to work with and a lot of people who need help. So I think that, you know, I, I, I love being involved. Thank you.